I was one of the most wanted men in Liverpool at the time. I was put on the 24 hour surveillance by a serious crime squad from London and Liverpool. And they said, come on, Teddy, we're going down the docks. We're going to do a whiskey iced. And the glass had gone right through my arm, chopped my fingers off. My arm was hanging off here, here. You're going to end up with life. If you carry on like this, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. We've made the headlines of the whole of the Liverpool Echo. The biggest headlines, one of the biggest robberies that would ever happen in Liverpool. It's like an alarm, but it screams crazy to scare you away. That was going off. The alarm was going off in the post office and we could hear the police sirens as we were getting into the car were smashing all over us. We had glass and milk all on our heads, all over our bodies. And as we got in the car, the glass and the milk was all in the car. He said, Terry, I'm taking you to Southampton. I've got a friend. He's going to get you on the Queen Elizabeth II, the ocean liner. Oh, there's a, a person upstairs in the penthouses. Um, they haven't showed up. Do you want to be the butler? And I went, yeah, OK, I'll be the butler. In life, when you've done something like this, what we were going to do. I don't know where it comes from and who we are and why we're doing it. But it takes something, some men to do it. All right, Terry Mugan has flown from California to be with us today. He's never, ever told his story before. This is an absolute exclusive He's had people biting at his heels to tell, to getting him to tell his story, but he's refrained. So we're deeply honoured. Terry is a man of respect all over the world, especially in the city of Liverpool, as you're about to hear. And this story is one of international dimensions because Terry's life, as you're going to hear, it may, it may be in multiple parts. Um, growing up in Liverpool, he ended up in a, a home in Witness, actually, right by near where. I grew, grew up as well. Horrific things happened to the people in the home and from so many people that go through things comes drugs, criminality, you know, that kind of behavior. In, Terry, in Terry's case, it was armed robberies, heavy duty stuff. He has a stroke of luck with the cops and ends up fleeing the country. Uh, he works on the QE2, <laughs> ends up Clint Eastwood's butler, which my dad found particularly interesting so huge thank you first for coming all this way thank man thank you, yeah. you know, oh, we are honored, thank you. honored. Yeah, yes and yeah. um, thanks for having me today it's a pleasure and me and jen had a fantastic meal last night yeah and we, we you know we heard just a, a, some of the stories yeah um but there's there's so many more you've also potentially got a book coming out this year as well yes. i'm going to hold this up now that is just a draft but you can you can capture the magnitude of the story there from Definitely. from that and uh, so if you are in the comments we're hoping you know teddy's going to get his book out later this year but we like to get one of the guests before they go back to where it all began to tell us you know one of the most moving or hardest hitting stories and i do believe you got one of those haven't you Tony? yes i was um assigned to a home in um truesdale estates just outside beverly hills and the home was the former home of Elvis Presley. And the people at the home, they, they owned the, the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And they were looking for what you call a majordomo. For the audience, I'll explain what a majordomo is. A majordomo is a guy who runs the home. He's in charge of the chef, the butlers, etc. He, and he puts a curriculum together. And he just, he's quiet. He's nice. He's very experienced. He's got multiple challenges with all the chef and everybody, who they are and what they do, entertainment. 
And this particular home I went to, it was very unusual. I, I only got interviewed by the secretary and she was the one that hired me and said, you know, you'd be suitable for the job. And I took the position and my living quarters was inside the home. And I was wondering, you know, where's the owner? And she said, oh, he's, in, he's at the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And I was wondering, you know, where's Mrs. Weinberg? Where is she? So oh, the secretary, oh, she's down. She's a, on the other side of the house. The house is about 6,000 square feet. So we carried on. I had the chef and we had the butler. We had a maid. And I'd, I was writing the curriculum. This particular day, I was told to come and meet Mrs. Weinberg. I walked down this corridor. And I always remember this corridor. It was like um, the movie out The Shining. <laughs> and it had all the flickering lights and everything. <laughs> and I was walking down and I was going, oh my God, this is like going to get your head chopped off. That's how bad I felt. And these big doors, and the secretary opened the door and said, come in. She said, this is Mrs. Weinberg. And she was in bed. And I looked at her. I thought to myself, this is a very unusual situation. But I used my own imagination from my experiences. And I was looking at her. So you've seen this woman, very pale. And she had this red hair streaking down. And she said to me, how are you? She starts screaming at me, you've been in the sun too much. Are you the new major domo? I said, yes, Ms. Weinberg, how are you today? So I proceeded to ask what, this evening what she liked for dinner. And um, she said, I want bagels and lox and salmon. I said, okay, we'll have that for you for your evening meal. Then all of a sudden she said, how's that chef? I'm not sure whether I like him. I said, oh, he's fine. He's, he's from the Four Seasons. And she shouted throughout the room, I hope he's, he's as good as my chefs at the Kahale Hilton in Hawaii. Otherwise he's getting fired. And so I just looked at her and, you know, I was putting two, two together, but I wasn't making any judgments at the time. Anyway, we went on in the home and we, she was fine after a while, but then there was one particular morning that I did wake up and I heard the noise of rumbling and my room was next door to the garage and I heard this rumbling and I looked at my watch and it was four o'clock. So obviously you think, you know, someone's going to steal the car, some, you know, from East LA or somewhere like that. They're going to come in and they're going to do something. I was a little bit like, okay. So I gets up, put my pants on, my shirt on, went out. And I just seen the smoke coming through the kitchen. And I went, oh my God, what's that? And I could smell it. And it was like fire, but it wasn't fire smoke. It was something else. So I ran out to the front door, opened the door. And I went round the back of the house. And I had a key and I opened the garage to let the smoke out. And all the smoke came out and then I was slowly looking at the car and I thought to myself, what's going on here? You know, somebody tried to steal the car or is there a short wire on the car or something like that? And to my amazement, I seen a, a pipe and the pipe was going from the exhaust into the window of the car. And I just seen this pipe going all the way in. I was going, what's that? And then as the smoke was clearing, I realized Mrs. Weinberg was in the car and she had the pipe in her mouth. So I ran, I opened the door and I dragged it out and I laid it down and I was shocked. And was, oh. So I went back in the house to call the police and then automatically with that, they call the fire engine and then they call the ambulances. They all come together. And obviously, you know, she tried to commit suicide. 
And then to my amazement, I just stood there and they were asking me questions. Asking me lots of questions. I didn't say too much. So, so like, you know, I was um, more empathy than any judgments. And but one thing did happen. When they were given the oxygen, one of the policemen had said to me, and the, the paramedic, he said to me, do you know how old Mrs. Weinberg is, Teddy? And I said, no, I'm not sure. I said, as approximately, she could be like 43. And she's lying on the gurney. She's going to the hospital to um, see the Sinai. And she takes the mask off and she shouts, 44! <laughs> and I just looked at her and I went, oh my God. I sort of gave up. And that was one of the significant experiences that I had in Beverly Hills. And did you ever find out why she did try to commit suicide? Well, obviously, she was mentally ill. And then that story went on. And as I write in my book, in the end, it cut turns into tragedy. Mm. Wow. All right, let's go back to where it all began then in Liverpool. Well, I was born in Scotland Road. Scotty Road. Scotty Road, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, my mum and my dad, they had seven of us. My dad, yeah, my dad was a lovely man. My mother was lovely, lovely people. But, you know, it's, it's Scotland Road. What can you expect? And we moved out of there, and we moved up in between um, Walton, Anfield, and Norris Green. We were right in the middle. And I was about eight years of age this morning. And I got up, and I just went out at three in the morning, got dressed, and I went out. I don't know why. I still don't know why. And I go to this place, and it was um, Freshfield Farm, milk. And in them days, Sean, you had the, you know, the horses that pull the milk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting outside, and this fella says to me, what are you doing here? I said, do you need any help, mate? And he went... You should be at school. What are you doing here? And I think it was, I waited an hour, it was about 4, 4.30. And anyway, he was probably lazy. Anyway, he went, go on, jump on, I'll get the kids to do the work. So I jumped on with him. I started delivering the milk and the orange juice and carried on. At the end of it, after like, we'd finished about half seven, eight o'clock, and he gave me a bottle of milk and a bottle of orange juice. That was my breakfast. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was my breakfast. So then uh, I just I just wandered the streets. Mm. It was like I was wandering the streets. So I walked down to the Anfield Cemetery and I went in there and I, I hid the orange juice in the corner there. And then I went home and my father was like away. He was in the Merchant Navy trying to support the family. And what happened was the the school board, where is he? Well, what is this kid? You know, why is he on the streets? And well, everyone was at school. I was the only one on the streets. And um, so anyway, the, the following day, I got up the same thing. I did the same thing. And I went and uh, got the milk. Delivered it and that. So Friday came. And he said, make sure you come Friday. He said, um, you can help me collect the money. So I went round. With him and I collected all the money with him and I seen this bag. He had a bag and it was just full of like half a crowns at the time and trippences and sixpences. And I looked at it and I went, wow, look at that. And then he had a wallet inside it with loads of pound notes and fivers and, you know, the old 10 pounds and all that. And I just looked at it. And the temptation was there right there to take it. But I left it. The following week, I did the same thing. But I got there on the Friday, two hours before, and I collected all the money. I collected all the money, and I put it in a bag, I put it in a bag, and I left. So I went to the Anfield Cemetery, Jen, and I buried it there. I buried it in the cemetery. And I used to go to the cemetery with my friends, and I'd say, come on, I've got all this money. Then the police had came to the house, and they're looking for me. We want that bag. Where does he put it? And they took me into custody. And that day, 
I never said a word to them. I always found the police to be, you know, in Liverpool, we were always against the police anyway. So I, was, I just went against them. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I think I was eight. Oh, yeah, I was eight. 1965, actually. So what happened was, um, I was targeted then. That was my life. That was the, the life of crime that I was about to go into. Did you manage to keep the bag yeah. hidden? Yeah, yeah, we kept and it. And remember where you planted it. Yeah, yeah, it was in the cemetery. <laughs> so um, I formed a gang. I had a gang. John Lally, um, Franny Jones, and my old friend, God bless him now, he's passed away, Ronnie Gibbons. And as I told you last night, Ronnie was the, the brains behind the Brinks job in New York for the eight million and they'd done the movie on him. So when we got the gang together, we started, we, none of us went to school. So our next move was something else. We still had the money in the, in the cemetery, but our next move was, what are we going to do? Where's the money floating? So it came on, it was the co-op. It was a Friday night, and we died the co-op all, all week. So after everybody getting paid on the Thursday and people getting the pensions and they were getting the money Friday would be like a big day for them to go shopping. So, you know, we knew the, the corp would close at six. So we, we went in at 5.30, goes in, got Franny to the, distract the cashier to go down and say, where's the can of beans? Franny would take the woman down the side. John would be outside with um, Gibbo. They'd be outside, and then I just jumped over, and I had a bag with me, and I just emptied the till. In them days, it was a wooden till, and just cleaned a lot out, and we put it in the bag, and then we jumped back over, and Franny would just walk out, and we walked out, and we just bump right back to the Anfield Cemetery. We buried it where the milkman's money was, and then what we did was we took about 20 quid. We went down to another shop, and we bought, um, in them days, you had the cigars, Hamley. We bought five of them. And we were smoking cigars. <laughs> and then we took a taxi huh. over to New Brighton. And we were smoking cigars. And then we went along in New Brighton. And then we came back. And then when we got back across the ferry in Liverpool, the police were waiting for us. And they took us into custody. Oh, your first so John, John and Ronnie... They were a little bit older than me, so they got charged. But I got released because I wasn't I was too young. So that was another blemish to be just waiting to get me. I didn't go to school. I had some little bits of school and that, but I was basically I was just doing my own thing. I was like uncontrollable at the time. I felt like, you know, there was no guidance. I just did my own thing. And we'd go on the streets. So there was a place down in um, Long Lane in Liverpool, and it's all the factories. So one day, I said to John, I'm going down to Long Lane. And in days, you had a place called Mother's Pride, where they delivered the bread. So the fella come out and I said to him, do you need some help, mate? And he went, yeah, go on, get in. And all the donuts and all that, and all the lovely bakeries in the back and all that. Oh, this is nice, and the seat was warm, you know. Mm. And he was driving it. So in my head, I had Friday in my head when he would collect all the money. So I decided I'll wait, I'll, I'll, I'll work with him for a week or two. And then on the Friday, when we get back to the, the Mother's Pride, we'll go and I'll just take the bag and I'll take his wallet. And eventually I did do that. I took that and I put it the bag over my shoulder and I got his wallet and I put it in my coat and I walked up all the way up Long Lane in Vazakli and um, I took it to to my stash in the Anfield Cemetery. I took it there. This was the start of my life. <laughs> so then I was targeted again then. Oh, we got to get this kid. we got to get him. So there was a home in um, in um, Sefton Park called Westfield on um, Green Lane, and I was taken into care. Mm. I 
I was I was taken into care. How did your parents feel about that? I think they were part of the wanting me to to have a better life because they'd seen the problems that I was having. So they was they were all for that to change where I was going to go in the future. But the problem there was that when I went into that home, um, it was mixed. There was girls and there were older boys. I was only eight. And one morning we were in line getting for our breakfast in the queue there. And, you know, I was playing around with a kid, as you do, you know, you're not in control. And I, I kicked a kid on by mistake and I didn't mean to. So the headmaster took me in and he, he came me. He came me on the hand four times on one hand and four on that. That's what they did in them days. So what I did, as soon as I had my breakfast, walked out and said, can I go to the toilet? Put my coat on, jumped right down Green Lane, on the bus, right back home. I was done, no control. Tried to get me back, no. Couldn't get me back. So we started doing our escapades again on the street, me, John and Ronnie. And um, we went to, there was a place in Norris Green called Broadway, um, which is, you know, it's been notorious, notorious in over the years. So we'd go there to Woolworths and we'd go in and we'd do a lot of shoplifting. Started shoplifting in there all over Broadway. And then we'd hide. Always go back to the cemetery for some reason. It was like our comfort zone. I the can't cemetery. believe the money was still there. Yeah, after everything that was time. still there. Yeah, <laughs> nobody knew, no one took it. John didn't take any. Or well, Ronnie, you know, said, Teddy, can we have some money? So we'd go back and we'd just <laughs> say, yeah, you know, what you want? 50, you know, I want half a crown. Give us half a crown each. And they went, you know, at the time they were made up with me. Like, I was, they, I was like the leader of the gang. And then eventually, Franny had got caught. He'd, he'd bagged at home. And the police said that I was with him. And I wasn't with him because I was his partner. So they said, how to get this kid off the street would be to take him into care and to be charged with burglary. And I'd never done a burglary. And I was taken into care. So they took me into care and I was put on an institute on, um, in Walton called Menlove Avenue. I went in there, but I was isolated. They had a special isolation unit and I was put in there and it was like locked up on my own because they just, they knew I, I was always running away. And we were under a section called 1948 to be given three years in approved school. This was in 1968. So he goes back to the magistrates and there's three magistrates in them days in the court. And they said, oh, well, we'd have to teach him a lesson. But they'd already had the record from the co-op, the milkman. It was all recorded in them days. So there was only one way the magistrate could do would be to take me under in on a section 1948. And that section was three years for proof school. Yeah. I went into the back of the, into the, the back of the, the magistrate's courts in the city centre. Now, could you imagine this? Could you imagine this? You've got a 10 year old kid. He's in the back of the magistrates. He's on his own in a the room. They've separated Franny from me. They didn't want us together. They've put these cuffs on me that are about three pounds in weight each. They've got a black Mariah pulling up at the side of the door to take this little 10 year old kid into custody and shipped off straight to Freshfield, Formby Freshfield to the approved school. This is how my life started. I arrived at the St. George's approved school in Freshfield and my sentence was three years. I went in there, it was like a, it's like a big old castle. It stands out. You can see it. It's like a haunted, ma it's a haunted mansion. It sits today empty. 
It was run by the Nugent Care Society, which comes under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. No, no. Now, when I got in there, there was a little bit of afraid. Didn't know what I was doing. We were lost. It was like being isolated, all the children. There was four houses. I think there was about 150 kids in there at the time. We settled down. But their policies, what they had for us, was the inside of the world, not outside it. Their policies that they could do what they wanted with us. And it was a breeding ground for paedophiles mm. and abusers and s sadistic men. That's what this was about. So the outside world didn't know. Children were going there. One of the things that they had was Mr. Hickey, he was the um, headmaster. He would take the child's pants down and bend them over and he'd give them six on the bottom. And the poor kid couldn't sit down for weeks. His, his bottom would be black and blue. There was another guy in there and they had a, this thing where if you, you spoke in line, where they'd get you out and they'd this on the head here. They'd hit you on the front lobe, which probably was causing some kind of concussions because some time of damage. And it was spent me, I'd spent about two and a half years in this home getting abused. One of the most significant things that stood out in my life was, which most of them were paedophiles, was proven later on under the Operation Care investigation in the North Wild. North, north of England, child abuse case. There was a guy, Mr. Matthews, he was a Marine. He was about six foot six. And what they'd do, they would say at three o'clock in the morning when they had the impulse, impulses for the children, they would say, okay, one child was talking, so we're going to get you out of bed. I'm like, you're going to have a cold shower. <clears throat> so they'd lead us down. This is in the middle of the night, getting us up at three o'clock in the morning. They take us for the cold shower, put the showers on. And they'd say, sub the left leg, sub the right leg, sub the left arm, sub the right arm. Okay, turn it around now, soap each other's back, bend over, face the wall. This is what, this is what the situation was going on. And we couldn't do nothing about it. There was children that did run away. One of the things that stuck out in my mind, there was two children that ran away in the summer. And they went over the sand dunes in Formby. And the tide came in. And unfortunately, they were getting chased and they had lost their life. And it was quite a significant thing at the time. But the children were so suppressed in their minds. They were, well, I would say the brains were absolutely cold. Because they were just, they didn't know what to do. My father had had a heart attack. I was 12. So I decided, I got a letter. And one of my sisters said that my dad had had a heart attack. And he was in um, the hospital. And they wouldn't let me visit him. Oh, no. So I decided to run away. And I went to a hospital called Walton Hospital. And I went into the hospital and I found out the ward that he was in. And I, and I sat next to him. <laughs> and um, hmm. he had all the tubes on him, beep, 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 beep. And I was just like, oh, my poor dad, you know. And my dad woke up and he went, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I went, hello, dad, how are you? <laughs> and, you know, because I love my dad, you know. And um, very sad, actually. Anyway... I left when the, the time was up, but I walked the streets and we um, got caught, got taken back. Automatically, where did I go? Right into the headmaster's office. Bends over, six of the cane. And then they put like um, a white jumper on you because you for being um, for being absconded, uh, you, you know, you're absconded. And you had to stand on the line for hours. Anyway, we, after that, I moved out. 
And then um, I was released. I was released from there. And then I had one day of freedom. I stole some food and I was at a bus stop. I got recommitted. Took me back to Menlove. Started again. Another three years. Mm. So then um, decided to run away. Ran away. This is when it starts. Back onto the streets of Liverpool. Um, started shoplifting. Got caught. Back to um, magistrates. Recommitted. Another three years. That was nine years. So next thing, they sent us to St. Aidan's in Witness. By the time I got to St. Aidan's in Witness, I knew a lot of them, but they'd made a big mistake at the time. They put me and Franny together. And Franny was absolutely psychotic. Um, so this day was in the, um, in the dining area. So we had a plan that we're going to attack them, attack the teachers. Instead of them attacking us, we're going to attack them. And how we would attack them, when you get your dinner in the evening, we're going to attack them and then we're going to smash all the windows and then we're going to go up, up the roof and then we're going to escape. So Franny, I said, get the knives. You get them knives over there and I'll get these knives here. And then just, uh, just throw the knives all right across the dining hall and just attack the two of them. So we did that. And then we ran, ran to a pool room, smashed all the windows, jumped out, climbed up a pipe and got up the roof. And then we got down, and then we, and then that was our getaway down Norlands Lane. Well, I used to do my paper round as yeah. a boy. <laughs> down Norlands Lane, Norlands Lane, yeah. and then we went over to. Then we went through Hong Kong. We jumped on a train, and then we headed to Liverpool. Got to Liverpool, and nowhere to go. It was cold, and wet. we still had the uniforms on from Saint Aidan's. So there was a, in the city centre. They had an um, army and navy store. Goes in there, um, and we. Helped ourselves, we've got a pair of jeans and a jean jacket. And we're walking through the city, and, I, and there was a group of lads I knew from Scotland Road. And they said, All right, Terry, how are you? I said, All right, mate, how are you? Now, Franny was a very unusual kid. He wore the NHS glasses, and he looked like you know, one of the nerds out the movies. And um, I always stuck by him, we were best friends. So these four guys that I'd met in the city centre. He said, Terry, what are you doing? I said, oh, we just ran away from, you know, the proof school and that. All right, well, do you want to come with us? And I went, yeah, all right. He said, but he can't come. I said, why? He said, look at them, the glasses on them. You know, that's what they do. These four fellas, um, today only one of them is alive. Only one of them. They had tragic lives. One of them is alive. His name is Joe Cavani. He's a very hard kid from Scotland Road. Very nice. I know Joe very well. And then me, um, the guy that was with him was um, Joey Wright, Joe Moran, and Edgar London. And they said, come on, Teddy, we're going down the docks. We're going to do a whiskey iced. I thought, okay. No, we had nothing anyway. So we're going to go down the docks, get into the, the warehouse, get a a big load of whiskey, and then we're going to push it up Vauxhall Road <laughs> um, to Joe's house. So as we get in the warehouse, we hear all the police with the dogs, and the doors are locked. We've got the doors locked, and we're in the whiskey house. We can't get out. <laughs> we can't get out. So next thing, they've got the dogs, and we're locked in. Come out and they're screaming at us and all that, and we're shouting. So anyway, there was a ladder. And the ladder went up this window and we went up the ladder and there was a window. And as I looked down, it led into the Liverpool and Leeds Canal. That was the only way we could get out. So we, up, we, we got on this balcony and we all dropped down and we went, we dropped into a, a little, like there was a little wall, but it, it dropped into the Liverpool and Leeds Canal. So we had to swim across the canal. I was a pretty good swimmer, Joe and Egan and all. And so we all swam across. And as we got to the other side, they just jumped up and, and done one. So then me and Franny, I was looking, where's Franny? Well, his glasses had come off. Oh, oh no. And he's in the middle of the river, the, you know, the canal. So I dived in and I grabbed Franny, brought him back. And then, then where did we end up? We end up in um, 
Anfield Cemetery. That's where we ended up. The following morning, I went to get some bread and milk from the co-op. And the woman knew who we were. She, she'd identified us and called the police. So she was the one that he robbed yeah. going back? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Years later, she was still there. And she remembered me. What are the chances? Yeah. And she, they called the police. So they all come and were surrounded in the cemetery. So they get me and Franny and take us. Franny was taken to a, um, an isolated unit in Warrington, Newtonley Willows, called Red Bank. And he had the experience with one of the child killers at the time that had killed two children. He was in an Excel to her. Am I allowed to say her name? Yeah, go for it. Um, it was Mary Bell. Oh. It was Mary Bell. He had the child killer. Because later on, when I seen Franny, he told me, he said, I've been in with Mary Bell. So I was sentenced to, at the time, the government to come out at the time with a short, sharp shock to shock us. So where am I going? I'm going, bump, takes me to um, Menlo Avenue. Magistrates, goes back in front of the same magistrates. They're always there at the same time. Well, Mr. Morgan, we're going to send you. We're going to shock you. You're going to detention. Gets three months in detention. Goes back. Same Black Maria. Same cuffs on. Right to Menlo Avenue for the week. Isolated unit. Bump. Shipped right out to Derbyshire. To Foster Knoll. For the short, sharp shock. Goes in there. Spends three months in the short, sharp shock. With all the scousers, Manchester lads. It was a barbed wire. And it was a it was like um, military exercises, all ex military. All ex military Marines and army fellas and um, you know, telling us what to do. But in it had some good stuff to it. It was like, you know, got you fit, very strong, lifting weights. You had to march two two hours a day. But it was a brutal Regiment, it wasn't there to help you. And then we worked in these cubicles where we would sand these components down for aeroplanes with sandpaper all day. And then same military exercise. So I thought after that, I'm going to get released. So when I got released from there, I was sent to... Back to Menlove. And I said, why am I back here? And they said, well, you're going to court. I said, why have I already been sentenced? He said, no, you're going back to court. I went back to the magistrates. I got another three years. And that was, because, sorry, I'm just going back, um, suffering the physical mental abuse you received at the hands of the staff and inmates begin to take its toll. That was still in Falston Hall. Yeah. That was in Fast and All. Yeah, it was taken as toll. <clears throat> and then... Can I ask what the physical and mental abuse you received was? Well, the physical and mental abuse was just mental abuse from um, violence, hitting us on the head, caning us. They were getting away with what they were doing. We weren't getting educated. We were under the, um, an umbrella of... Abuse constantly, where we were, I'd, we were, I, I would say, hyper vigilant, and and I think at the time then that the anxiety and the mental situation was setting in our brains that we were becoming unstable. I would say, and this would prove later on in life, that would come out later on in life when we were examined. Actually, that came out, and I'll get to that. So I had gone back to the magistrates and I was given another three years to go to another proof school. It was called St. Joseph's in Nantwich. And this was on the umbrella of the Christian brothers. So when I arrived, I had a confrontation with some Manchester kids because I was the only scouser in there. They fall from Manchester. And they just battered me. So I took that. I took that from them. I didn't, you know, that was it. I took them. Because the Manchester guy, he wanted to straighten it, so I had to straighten it with him and battered each other inside the home and that. 
And then I settled down a bit and I went, nah, I'm done. I'm out of it. I was, I was getting old now. I was getting older and I couldn't really take So I, I, I just didn't belong there. So I done one, got off, got the bus, right down from Nantwich, right on to crew, bump off to Lime Street. Got to Lime Street and I met an old friend and um, Richie Harrison from Scotty Road and we stole a car and we're going down the dock road in the car and then a police bike comes after us. This police bike comes after us and we're panicking that. Anyway, Richie crashes the car into a wall and I fall out. I break my leg and the cop is battering us, kicking us and everything. Anyway, he calls an ambulance and I can't move. Shipped back to the hospital, one hospital. I get bandaged up, plaster, your legs. And then the three of them came from St. Joseph's to get me. Goes back to St. Joseph's, gets put in my dorm in solitary confinement for six weeks on my own. And they fed me and I couldn't walk. Not much education, just left alone with some books. So eventually I had to settle down. And um, what they did was the abuse started there again. I got put into um, a welding shop and um, I was trying to do some welding on these iron rods. And um, I'd done it wrong because I wasn't educated. I wasn't trained. And the, the guy in there who was... He was running the metal shop. He just punched me right in the jaw. And he punched me in the jaw. And nearly broke my jaw. And um, nothing was done about it. I did mention, you know, I wasn't snitching or nothing like that. I just pointed it out to the headmaster. I said, you tell him, he, he, he hit me. And if he does it again, he's going to, he's, he's had it. You know, we couldn't, even though we could fight back, you know, you couldn't do that. Because then we would pay the consequences. They wouldn't. Because they were in control. That was the umbrella that we were under. So I decided to run away. And I'm off again. So I was off again. And I ran away. Went. And I get I got caught in um, Liverpool. And then they brought me into custody. And then they escaped from Menlove Avenue. How did you escape? I smashed all the windows. <laughs> and um, I put the sheets together. And I tied down from the bed. See, in Men Love, you had these iron bars and we tied the sheets, me and this kid. And we smashed all the windows and then we just got down and we were gone. Boom, gone, gone. Yeah, all escaping. The great escape from, from Men Love Avenue. Yeah, not many kids did he? So gets to Liverpool. What happens? Gets caught again. Gets caught again. Only one alternative. Gets caught again for shoplifting. One alternative. Borstal. Ooh. Borstal. That's the only thing. Anyway, then, before the Borstal, I'm sent. I'm, I was. I think I was the youngest kid. And there was a, um, a remand centre in Risley. I get sent to Risley. I think I was 14 and a half with all these men. I get sent to Risley. And I'm on a section. I, I, I don't. I, I don't recall a section, but it was Borstal. I'm under a, a section of Borstal to be sentenced to Borstal for six months to two years. So we waited in Bo in um, in Risley. Now in Risley at the, at that time, the conditions were very appalling. Absolutely appalling in the seventies. Absolutely um, seventy three. So there was a guy in there on the wing, Eddie Davis from the South End. And um, he started a riot and they got on the roof in Risley in 73. They get on the roof. 72, 73 it was then. They get on the roof and um, there's a big riot. So we're all banged up 23 hours a day. We can't get out. So we're waiting for the Crown to come to the Crown Court to go to the Crown Court in Liverpool. And I'm with one child. And he's he's 
you know, we worried, I'm going to get Borstal. Everybody in the country was feared of Borstal. <laughs> You'd rather go in the army or the marines. When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Coro Snacks. Coro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. And the energy balls are delicious. Oh, they're my favourite, the salted pistachio. Ooh. Um, wait to have this this morning. Let's see what this one tastes like. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Their bulk packaging allow them to offer their customers high quality products at a fair price. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Then Borstal. Hmm. That's what would happen. Can you explain to perhaps the American viewers what Borstal was like? Oh, to the American viewers, Borstal's like, it's not like juvenile law in America. It's an institution where you're going to get... It's like a sharp, sharp shock, but it's worse. It's actually... Actually, Borstal was for Britain's most toughest children. That's what it was for. And I, I would actually find that out when I got there. Because we were pretty tough at the time, street fighting. You know, because I'd been in boxing gyms with Ronnie Gibbons, who was a, he turned out a professional fighter. I'd been with Ronnie, training with him, boxing with him for years, when I, I'd see him in and out, when I ran away. I'd, oh, we'd go to St. Saint, Teresa's Saint gym in um, Norris Green. So Borstal, to the American view, it's like a... a a very tough institution, but it's worse than juvenile all. And you're on, it's like a prison actually, it's just the same as prison. So it came this day, we're all going to the Crown Court in Liverpool. One particular kid stuck out to me. His name is Milesy. And he was, he was petrified. So we were all, it's, the Crown Court in Liverpool, it's like dungeons underneath them. And we goes up the judge and the judge is sitting there with his big red and his sash on. And, oh, you've been this and you've been that and I'm going to send you to Borstal. I'm going to give you this and this, you know, the way they do the summing up. So we were all sent to Borstal. This kid comes down, he's crying. I'm not going to be able to do it. But we didn't think about it. Because we were probably on our way to being institutionalised anyway. It was just another another thing that was happening in our life. That's what was happening to us. So he comes down, he's crying in the cell. And with a few other kids. So we get shipped then on a bus. Where are we going? We're going to Strangeways. Notorious Strangeways. In Strangeways then they had him a wing. It's an allocation wing for Boston boys, all tough kids. So he goes in there, gets on this wing. Usually you're there for about three weeks to a month before you get allocated to a Boston. He goes in and it's three to a cell and they're preparing you for Boston. That it's, it's so regimented that the all your kits all on the beds, you can't lay on the beds. You've got to sit on the chair all day. Only at night you can remove the three of us in a cell. And we're getting abused by the prison guards, the screws. They start on us because we're Boston boys. We're going to give you this shock, this treatment. And none of them used to say much. So the first day there, the next night, I woke up the morning and I looked at Milesy's cell. And it was sealed. And I was looking at it going, why is that sealed? What's going on here? Anyway, sorry to say, he'd committed suicide. This was one of the first experiences that I'd had before I actually got to Boston. This, this was the, where the brain had just gone 
the fear had gone in and said, well, you know, this was the first experience I had. And I remember that and it stayed with me most of my life, thinking about the kid. Anyway, it was September, I remember, and we were shipped off. Shipped off to Boston. It was 72, 1972, 73, one of them years. So we get to this bull, Boston in Hull. All got off the bus. It's like a jail. Big massive prison. Tough guys. London, the Geordies, Manchester, Birmingham. A few scousers. Goes in. Come as we get off the bus, they're giving us all the marching orders, go this and under our breath we're just going, fuck is, you know, fuck off. You know, you know, you know, you know, they thought they were tough, but you know, we were tough. So then what happened was, gets in on this wing on the borstal, settles down, settle down, you meet kids and that, you know, there's a few hard cases, there's a few f- fellas who think they're the fucking daddy and all that. This is where, where, we, where we really pick it up now, the strength. This is where we have to pick our metal strength up. Because I was born with metal strength. I had to be, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here to survive. It's in, absolutely impossible. I speak for them kids. I'll never ever, I've never ever forgot any of them. And especially Ronnie and John and Franny and Milesy and Joe Moran and all them kids that I knew in Scotland. Oh, they were good kids. It was just a way of life. So we're in Boston and we had to march every day the same thing. We're putting a, a woodwork shop. We're under this micro, the micro managing us. Do this, like machines. This, do this, do this. So one instance, come off the yard, and it's it's just like in 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 scum, but I think in real life scum was inside scum, was worse than the movie, because they only portrayed so much in the movie that they couldn't show the real life in scum, of the children being raped. They did show it in parts of it and things like that. And um, they showed one kid where he got a letter in the movie where he was, he got a letter and um, one of the teachers was reading to him and she said, oh, the letter, um, somebody had died and she thought it was the dog and it wasn't, it was his wife. He says, that's my wife. So that's how they did the movie. So my experience was, it was a brutal institution. I'd had this experience where we come off the yard, Scousers, Geordies, everyone from Manchester, all want to fight. Who's the boss? So this guy came off the, the yard, and he was about six foot, and he was looking across at me after we come marching. And he went, um, you, upstairs. And then he was the daddy. He was the daddy of the Borstal. So these other two scousers behind me, I said to them, just hang on here, will you? So I took my coat off, goes up, and there's a thing called a recess. And uh, he was a big lad. So I just weighed into him, and he'd never experienced what you call, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Sean or Jen. It's called a Liverpool kiss. No. <laughs> okay. A bit of a Glasgow. Well, Liverpool kiss was... Um, yeah, basically, it was a Liverpool kiss, but they didn't know. So it's head button. Joe Cavana, my old mate from Scotty Road, was brilliant, Harry. And I learnt a lot from Joe from doing it. So we didn't realise this kid. I got him in the corner, and I just head butted him, and I just knocked him out. And then I got him on the floor, and I battered him. I just pounded and pounded and pounded him from the boxing skills that we were trained as a young kid. Anyway, I was taken then, put into solitary confinement for one month on bread and water for four days. You got bread and water in them days. No food. Got put in for a month. Bump, I'm registered then. Violence. I've got no chance. After that, it went on for a while, but then there ain't a lot of respect. There ain't a lot of respect for doing that. So it sort of come like, Part of the daddy. So 
they had this big dining hall one day and we all decided to cause a riot. And them reports, they couldn't have done that in, that, in the movie because they must have had them reports from someone in there to portray that in the movie. I've always said that. So one day we decided we were going to cause a riot with them because we were getting bullied by the screws in there. So this day we caused a riot. We got all the tables, we kicked them off, we threw all the... They were steel trays against the wall and everything. And they all couldn't put us all in the block. They all just had to separate us, calm us down. It went on for hours and hours. It was absolutely bananas, <laughs> just like the, the movie. <laughs> anyway, we... we, we we all settled down and then they just let us go quietly. We had actually won that battle and we quietly went. So it went on for, I ended up doing about eight months. I did about four months in the block in solitary confinement for other situations like um, the night watchman, my roommate underneath him, in my cellmate, he'd tell the night watchman to fuck off. Fuck off, you cunt. And then the night watchman would come in the next morning when he was going off his shift. He said it was him. So they marched me then back across the yard. And the yard was like, it was a little block on its own. Solitary confinement. And it was absolutely horrible. And inside the block, you had to walk inside the block an hour a day. And at night you had these lights on. A little light on at night. So finally, I was released from Borstal. Out back into the world. I didn't really know it at the time. Because I'd been now. Phew, I was 15 going on, on to 16. Come out. And we started. The gang got back together. Me, Franny, and we brought another kid in. They'd been in approved schools too. But we were all out free. So what we started to do, we started doing snatches and night safes. I had an idea that we would start them where the money was flown in, in the area. It was good. And we just, because we, we probably couldn't function to do a job. We never had the discipline. <laughs> we would, couldn't get a job. No one would give us a job. So we just carried on. We started doing night, snatches and night safes. The first snatch we did was, um, it was a Woolworths in Broadway where we, the manager would take the money to the bank and we'd have him on Friday afternoon and as he was taking the money and he'd have it and we'd just come behind him and snatch it and then we'd just run and we'd run and run and run and we'd get away. We were doing them, we were doing stores, we were doing like off licences. We were doing cinema houses in Liverpool where on a Friday night where they collected all the money, people going to the cinema. And on the Monday, we'd watch and then went to the bank, do that. This particular time, I'd left Liverpool and I'd gone down to Brighton to see my brother. And I started doing some shoplifting. And I went in the shop. It was called Debenhams. They really just closed down. <laughs> you have the Yeah. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would have closed out a long time ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> With all the um, all the shoplifting and everything. Probably. Yeah. But, no, yeah. but well, they've Might done well, haven't they? To it. Yeah. They've done, <laughs> yeah, they've done well. So yeah. what we did, we, we started going in Debenhams and that. And this particular Saturday, the manager came out and I had a briefcase. And he went, come here, you. And the two shirts were in the bag. And I went, I ah, get lost. And they actually took the briefcase. They took the fingerprints off it. And I'd been arrested in Brighton before. I'd been arrested before in Brighton. And I was shipped to live. I was actually in a, um, a prison called Ashford in Middlesex. Ashford. Yeah. And they'd ship me to... Back to Risley, and um, this day they got the fingerprints. So I was in Liverpool, and I'm I'm doing a snatch that day. Me and John Lally, 
we're doing the snatch. Anyway, we, we do the snatch and we get 550 quid. It was quite, you know, it was a bit of money then. Goes downtown, buys some clothes, gets dressed up. Actually, um, I bought a sheepskin. Oh, nice. And next thing we go to a local area this this Friday night. And it's... Um, goes in, having a few glasses of lager. And all of a sudden, I'm surrounded by four detectives. And t- there was a sergeant and another police officer with him. And I went, uh-oh. They want us for the the snatch that day. So the policeman says to me, get outside. I said, no. And I had the glass of lager and he punched me with a stick. So I threw the, the glass of lager at him. I hit him on the shoulder and I ran. And I had to run around the bar and out. But as they came behind me, they pushed me. They pushed me. And my arm went through the window, this arm here. And the glass had gone right through my arm, chopped my fingers off. My arm was hanging off here, here. Yeah, you showed me last night, it's like a shark bite. Yeah, showed you that, didn't I? Mm. And then what happens is the artery had burst. The artery had actually burst, so I was conked out. And And then the cops started kicking me. So I woke up. In Walton Hospital. I just had emergency surgery to save my life. But I was, when I woke up, I was cuffed to the bed. I've just had emergency surgery to save my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm handcuffed to the bed. And I'm going, oh my God, what's going to happen here? Thinking, oh, they've got me. Now, in them days, if they did get you for that, it would have been in my circumstances. It would have been five years in detention. Because that's what they gave you. It was, de- it was called detention. I would have got five years. So this cop comes in to me and he said to me, okay, we're going to be taking you to Brighton in a few days. And I looked at him. I said, what for? He said, you were shoplifting in Brighton. And that was a relief. That was a relief to me. So next thing takes me, a few days later, takes me to Cheapside and Liverpool, drove down to Brighton, goes to the Brighton magistrates, remanded me in custody. I get sent to uh, a prison outside Brighton called um, Lewis, Lewis Prison. Goes in Lewis Prison on remand for the crown, for two shirts, two shirts. So I'm in the prison and I'm doing physiotherapy on my arm, doing physio. And this guy is, he's bringing me my breakfast and that because I couldn't, couldn't do nothing with my arm. I could only walk and I'm getting all this physio. And I'm, the physio sa- says to me, how would you like the guy who's coming helping you, the fella? I went, yeah, he's all right. Said, um, said, that's Gordon Goody, the bank robber. And I went, is he? I said, um, oh, they're my idols anyway. <laughs> I said, I love them. <laughs> and it was Gordon Goody. <laughs> and Gordon Goody used to come. He was Irish, I think. He was the leader of the, um, um, the great train robbery. Mm. And he was dead nice. So anyway, I was waiting for the trial to come in um, Lewis Crown Court. Pleaded guilty. I thought, I might get bossed all again. I might get six months. Goes in front of the judge. Judge said, I've got your record here. You've done a bit of everything. Now you're going to be doing a little bit of this. I'm giving you two years in prison. I just looked at him and went, What could I do? Gets two years. I'm sentenced to two years in prison. Where am I going? I'm up down in, I'm down in Lewis. I get shipped out to Ashford. 
in Middlesex to an allocation unit for one month. Goes in the office. They said to me, you're getting shipped to um, Wormwood Scrubs. You're going to be doing your sentence in Wormwood Scrubs. I was 16 years of age. Oh. By the time I'd got that two years, Sean, I'd been sentenced to nearly 17 years. Nearly 16, 16, 16 and a half years of my life. It was horrendous for the kid. I, I didn't realise till later on in life I realised. Anyway, get shipped to Wormwood Scrubs. YP wing, tough place, goes in. None of them had done Borstal. These kids hadn't been in scum. I'd asked a lot of them. So there was a bit of bullying going on. And I went to this Scotch fella. See these two here? See them? When we go on down for our dinner, I said, we're not going down. We're going to break the, the legs and the, the chairs in the cell. And when they come up, when they go in the cell, we're going to give it to them because they were bullying everyone. And the Scotch fella had agreed to me. So when they came up, they went in the cell and we battered the two of them. That's what you did in jail. We give it to the two of them and then we closed the door behind them. But they knew it was us. Boom, shipped down to solitary confinement and wearing with scrubs. Next thing, in them days, what they would do then, that's assault, grievous bodily harm. They bring the magistrates in to the jail and you'd be sentenced again. But the, the, the governor said, I'm going to take this into my own hands. You'll lose six months remission. I lost six months. I was put in the block. And the governor came to me the next day and he said to me, the way you're going to carry on with your life, you're going to be doing a life sentence. Yeah. You're going to end up with life. If you carry on like this, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. And I always remember said to him, I'm doing a life sentence now. That's, that's, I always remember saying that. I've done a life sentence. So he said, Terry, you need to behave, lad. And which I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to behave. So next thing, I said, listen, am I going to spend my sentence here? He went, well, we could sort something out for you. I said, I want to get moved to Walton Prison in Liverpool. My family's there. How are they going to come down and visit me? So anyway, I did my time in the block. I'd lost six months. So now I'm doing two and a half years. I'm doing two and a half years. So next thing, get shipped up to Liverpool a month later. Goes to Liverpool. Goes into Walton Prison. There's a wing called B-Wing. It's where all the YPs are. As soon as I walked in, I knew everyone all over Liverpool. I got a, a cell. My brother was actually in there as well. Yeah. And um, he got me a cell and we got in the same cell together and that. And, um, but, you know, we had a, a bit of a bad time because my father, he got sick and my father died while we were in prison and um, we were handcuffed, me and my brother, to my mother's home. We got handcuffed together. It was the most devastating thing in life you could see. And, you know, we had these prison officers over us. And, you know, we're burying our father. And, you know, we're cuffed. Watching my dad's grave. It was absolutely devastating. I bet that broke your mother's heart. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. So, goes back to jail. Everything was fine in the, in, in, in well, because we knew each other, you know. It was like, it was, it, was a, it was a homely prison, but it was tough. I got a job in the laundry. And this is where I met some of the most no notorious men in Britain. I, I, I had to go in the gym because my arm, and I was getting physiotherapy on my arm at the time. 
but I was just doing laundry. But they must have had me file and said, I think you're tagged. Watch them. Keep your eye on them. So I goes in and I was doing the laundry with these fellas. But then I was going to the gym. I goes in the gym. This big fella's there, six foot four. Massive guy. We're doing circuit training every day in Walton. This massive guy. I think he was on category A. At the time, he comes in with these screws. He must have been, because he was guarded everywhere. It was Paul Sykes. <laughs> it was Paul. So I got to know Paul. And he was he was all right, like. And just got to know him in the jail and that, you know, every day going and then. I always remember this day, he was arguing with the screws. And he picks the weights up. He throws them right across the gym, about 400 pounds. They go right across the floor. Absolutely bananas. I'll fucking do the lorries and all that. So about eight screws came in, took him back to his cell. And I was just looking at him like that. Fucking <laughs> nutter. So it took eight screws to get him down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Paul was a big guy. He was a boxer. Yeah. Yeah, he was. But he was all right. And I, I don't know what things have been said about him in the past. But to me, it was, not, it, was, it was all right. So I carried on in my life in there. He put a guy in a coma for a month, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's when he was boxing. Yeah. That's when he was boxing then, Sean. Oh, yeah, wow. when he turned professional. Mm-hmm. But he was too old then. Mm-hmm. He actually come to Liverpool when I, when I got out. Went to see, I went to see John Conti fight. John Conti fought at the stadium. And I went to see him. And he come home and he said hello to me. And they're all looking at me like that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, I'd, I'd done my time in Walton, but I had, a, I had another bad situation in Walton with a prison officer. Early in the morning, we were giving the water to the prisoners, so we were let out early. But for some reason, this officer, this screw, he didn't like me, and he decided not to open me up this day. So when I come out, we got a little bit angry for not getting opened up. And... Um, he went, fuck you and all that. I'm not opening you. You shouldn't be given. You should be locked up away. So I got the, um, as I come out, went to slop out. I got me, me bucket and I fucking lashed it over him. And it went all over him. The shit and the piss went all over. And he, he, he was in the army, this fella. And he was running down the stairs. He was shitting himself. I said, now go on, fuck off. And um, next thing, about 10 of them got me come up. He got me, bump straight in the block. Right in the block. Yeah, 1974. 1974. Um, I got done for assault, lost 30 days remission. Spent 30 days in the block. Yeah. Then um, my time came, got on with it, just carried on, Liverpool, finally released. So eventually I come out, I come out of Walton. I always remember the day it was, it was March the 8th, 1974. And I'm walking down the street and it was raining. And I've got the shirt on that I robbed in Brighton. I've got the shirt on my back. <laughs> I've got this yellow Ben Sherman on. Anyway, I get home to my mother's house. And um, unfortunately she became sick at the time and she wasn't well and my other brother was there Alan I was very close with Alan and he said to me he said Terry I'm taking you to Southampton I've got a friend he's going to get you on the Queen Elizabeth II the ocean liner and I was like okay okay (laughs) anyway stayed home for a few weeks and that and um, eventually, I was taken down to Southampton, taken to me. Alan had been in the Merchant Navy, my brother. He'd done the, um, the maiden voyage on the QE2, Alan. And uh, he was a lovely lad. And he was looking out for me. And I think he had a bit of, you know, things in his head. Because when I ran away from the homes, he took me back and he didn't realise at the time what was happening. So he... he, he, he he felt like he had to do something for me, and he was. 
And he would have done it anyway if he, if he wouldn't have done that anyway. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. So he goes, goes down to Southampton. And he said, you're going to stay with my mate. He's got a flat in Southampton. So I went down, we stayed, we had a little drink. I didn't drink that much. And that, you know, being in, locked up most of my life that age and, and the physical training that we'd done. Goes to Southampton and um, meets a fella called John Callow in Southampton. And he said to me, Teddy, I'm going to get you on the QE2. You're going to be a specialist cook. Cook. In American, it's cook. I'm gonna, you're going to be a specialist cook on the Queen Elizabeth II. You've got to go over to Cunard. I know this guy in Cunard. <clears throat> He's going to get you a discharge book. He's going to get you a seaman's book. You're going to get all your photographs done. And you're going to be a chef on the QB2. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm made up. <laughs> but also, I've got no experience. So this is the this is another challenge I've got to face in my life. I've just gone through all that in my life. Short, sharp, shock, Boston. Twelve years of proof schools, and I'm going on the QB two as a professional man in the outside world to be trained as a specialist cook. It takes years for the specialist cook to be trained, and I'm just walking on the ship, and I'm going to be a specialist cook. So that was another challenge for me in the real world of life. So it goes down, and this morning I'm going onto the QE2. I just looked at it. What a ship. It was beautiful. Goes on, signs on at the purser's office, does everything. They give me my uniforms, and they take me upstairs to the kitchen, and the ship is sailing to New York. It's doing the transatlantic, goes upstairs, during the kitchen and there's a thing called chain and potatoes you have to like in there it's a, a an english style where very fancy potatoes you have to turn it and the peel and then you have to roast them and i couldn't do it so i was i was fucking all up i was fucking all the potatoes up <laughs> so next thing this this chef said fucking get him out of here i don't want him in here I don't want him on my fucking corner. And I'm going, oh my God. I was fucking slapping in a minute, you little so-and-so. But, you know, anyway, I left it. Then I got moved in. And an old friend of mine, I'll give him a shout out now, Tony Lawless, lovely man. He came to me rescue. And he went, what's all the commotion about? And he said, are you from Liverpool? I went, yeah. He went, get over here with me. That's what the scouts is to. <laughs> so I got over with Tony, my old mate. Oh. And um, I started doing sandwiches with him and cooking soup, boiling soup and that, and I helped him. So when I, I stayed in the kitchen, we, we'd stop in New York. Now, my mate, Ronnie Gibbons, he went to New York to be a professional fighter. And I was telling all my mates on the ship that I knew him, you know. I said to Tony, we've got to go and see Ronnie. He's turned professional. And he was under a guy called Gil Clancy. And he was at Gleason's gym in Manhattan. I couldn't wait to get off the ship in New York. So we get to New York after five days. Goes up to Gleason's gym in um, Manhattan. Goes up there. Walks up these stairs. 
and um, Gil Clancy's in the gym, and he goes, yeah, can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for Ronnie Gibbons. And he went, yeah, they'll be in in a minute. So Ronnie comes in, just walks in, and I went, all right, lads, how are you? He went, oh, my God. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm on the QE2. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yeah. So next thing, he's, I stayed with him like for about four hours. He, he had four sparring partners. He said, Teddy, I'm going to be welterweight champion of the world. That's what he said to me. He did make it to number one in the world. He did actually make it. So anyway, here's the two of us. All little kids when we were eight. We're 18, 19 now, in New York, walking down 42nd Street. From Liverpool to New York, walking down 42nd Street together. Anyway, she said, anything going on on the QE2? I said, oh, I don't know yet. I don't know what's going on. So we, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next month. I go back on the QE2, stayed with the kitchen. This guy came to me and he said to me, why don't you become a waiter? You know, there's more money, you can make tips and that. So I said, all right. So I went down to the office and I put a request in to, do, um, to be a waiter. <clears throat> so I put that request in and I became a waiter. Went up what you call um, topside. Started out first at um, washing glasses, cleaning the glasses. They had to be spe- spotless in first class for all the customers. And um, a lot of stars were going on there at the time. Anyway, I got better at that. And I got this job as a, a first class waiter, saving cocktails. And I ran the old, the whole restaurant. And I was making a fortune. So I thought of a way out to make more money. And, you know, with the Americans, you know, sometimes they wanted a large vodka. That means two, but I'd give them one and charge them two. And we started making a fortune on the ship <laughs> and things were getting great. So we got to Southampton and we were getting signing off the ship for a, a month. You do three months on and three months off. And what I noticed in the corner was the wages. There was two suitcases and it was just full of £10 notes like this. And 20 pounds, and it was incredible. I just looked at it, I took one look, and I went, Oh my God, I'm having that. That's the first thing I thought of. There must have been thousands and thousands, because there was 1,800 staff on the ship they had to pay out. So we waited for the purses after they'd done the payout, and I followed them back to Cunard. That's where they came from. Anyway, Gets off the ship and I thought, go to Liverpool. I know a few fine crime families in the South End that been in Borstal with, been in jail with. And I went to two particular ones, very well known they are, in, in, the, in the area of Liverpool. I had cases, done a lot of violence, and they knew me. And I said to them, do you want to come down to Southampton? And when these fellas, the purses are taking the money, the takings onto the QB2, I said, just have it off them. I said, I'll, I'll drive or I can take you. Because I'd done the snatches and night safes and we were experts at that. So I said, I'll drive. And anyway, they said, okay, we'll come down to Southampton. Anyway, they didn't show up and I was very disappointed at them. So I left it. Goes back on the QE2. And... Started carrying on. So we'd done a whale cruise. Finished the whale cruise. A lot of stars on there. So this day, goes back on, signs on. And this guy said to me, oh, there's a, a person upstairs in the penthouses. Um, they haven't showed up. Do you want to be the butler? And I went, yeah, okay. I'll be the butler. And it, the service was no difference. It's all silver service and it's the personality and it's just the way it was. So I said, okay. So I went up to the penthouses and I started working in the penthouses. We had two floors and then down below we had the Queen's Grill 
was the best service in the world you've ever seen. Anyway, he was coming on. He was coming on the ship, Elizabeth Taylor oh, and Richard Burton. They're coming on the ship and they've been on a, a lot before I heard. So, took care of them a few times. And one, I always remember one night, she, she's had a few drinks, Elizabeth. And um, she said, Teddy, can I get another drink, please? And I went, yeah, sure. Gets to the drink, goes to the room. And she was, she was a beautiful woman. And I looked at her. And you know, as you see beauty when you're traveling with, around the world, you see different cultures and you see different people. And I seen this woman and looked at her. I always remember our Liverpool sense of humour. And I, gave, I knocked on the door and I gave the drink. And Richard was downstairs and he was gambling because they had a casino on there. And I, I looked at her and I just looked at her and I went, I wish you were 19. <laughs> and she looked at me and smiled. And I went, good night. And she went, good night. <laughs> and... I had a look like a bit of a friendship with her. So, so you that, actually flirted with Elizabeth Taylor? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? What's wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with that. I think every man on the planet would worry. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I, I honestly think if she would have been 19, I think she would have flirted with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think she, I think she would have liked to. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, but then, you know, with the, um, the mind of a criminal, there was things going through my mind that I didn't like. And one of the things that I came up was to, to steal Elizabeth Taylor's diamonds. And one particular diamond was the, in, the ring that Richard bought for eight million. And it was easy, it was in the room. It was so fascinating. So I thought of that in the back of my mind. So on the ship, we have this thing called the pig with all the staff drinking the pig. So I went down there one night <clears throat> and I walks in. I was on my own. Took my uniform off, put a white shirt on, a grey pair of pants. And I walked in, there was a girl sitting at the bar. And I took a look at her. I thought, she's nice. And she's sitting by herself. And I went over and said, all right, love, how are you? Do you want a drink? She went, yeah, I'll have a drink. I said, what do you do? She said, oh, she was from London. She said, I'm the manager of the, the jeweler store. I said, are you? She went, yeah. She said, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm in the penthouses. And sometimes I'm topside. And I said, I said, are you the manager of the store where, they, where all the shops are? She went, yeah. So I said, all right. So I had a few drinks with her. She was absolutely gorgeous. Really beautiful woman. And... Um, she was only 19. I said, do you want to come out with me tomorrow in New York? I'll take you out for dinner. She said, yeah. So I took out for dinner. Not we ever became of it, we were just friends. So one night I said to her, do you want to come and have a drink with me? And she went, no, I can't. I'm doing the inventory. I said, what inventory? She went for the jewellers. So my head starts going again, hang on, the inventory for the jewellers. <laughs> now you're talking about high class in these days. Very high class. So she told me, I said, well, let me bring a beer up to you and we can have a, a drink together in the jewellers. So it goes up. Goes up there. And she said, oh, we're putting all new displays in. And she's doing the inventory. And I'm looking at the inventory. I said, how much is here? And she went, it's about five and a half million. She said, we're going to be putting the displays out and we're going to be putting the diamonds and on display. It's a new thing. And I went, oh my God. I'm going to have the lot of it. That's the first thing I thought of. Who, who, who am I going to do it with? Soon as the ship docks in New York, right up to see Ronnie Gibbons. I know Ronnie. He's the main man. Shoots up there. Ronnie, he's training it on. Wait for me, Terry. Same old dance. Comes down. Said, listen, I've got two things here, lad. 
let's go and have a beer. No, he didn't drink and I, he just drank water and I had a beer. And then we're just sitting in the dining room on 42nd Street. And um, they just done the movie Taxi Driver. And I'd gone past that and I was watching them do that movie. And um, I said, listen, lad, I said, um, what do you fancy on this, lad? Get on the ship. I said, there's about five million on, on, in, the, um, in the display cases. I said, oh, you can have Elizabeth Taylor's jewellers. I said, but you know what? Elizabeth Taylor's a lovely woman, you know, wouldn't like to really steal off her. It was sort of setting in then. I thought that, you know, my life was getting a bit more better and I was doing well. So our goal was to do the jewellers. So being on the ship a while, and I was doing well, I was making a lot of money, coming home, was going to buy a house in Liverpool, and I'd met my future wife, which was Annette, and she was my lovely sweetheart, got engaged to her, and I went back to the QE2, and um, still had lots of friends on the QE2, and so the plan was we're going to do the jewellers, there was five million on display in the middle of the night when it was docked in New York, when everyone was asleep, we were going to use a, a fire hydrant on the ship. Me and Ronnie would have masks on together and then we had gloves and then he would put all the diamonds into a bag and then we had my room where I would we'd go to. We had different levels of the ship. We were on the bottom of the ship. That was our accommodation. That's what we would do. All of a sudden, I bring Ronnie on the ship. And I, I look behind me. And we're getting followed. And then these two guys said, excuse me. And I went, yeah. He went, um, we know you. Who's this guy? I said, he's my friend, he's just coming on for some lunch. No, you're not. You, off the ship. So I walked down with him. They took him off the ship. And they said to me, when we get back to Southampton, we need to speak to you. So I just carried on with my work. Guess to Southampton in the morning. We dock at seven o'clock from Transatlantic. Four busies. I knew they were busies. I knew they were coppers, detectives and that. But I didn't know which squad they were from. Takes me. Takes me in a car. Takes me to the Cunard building. Sits down with me and he said to me, um, you're a member of the Irish Republican Army. And I went, what? I said, no. Oh, yes. You've been drinking with the Irish Republican Army. Do you drink with Irish men on the ship? I went, yeah. I said, I have a drink with them. So at the time, the Irish Republican Army were going to blow the QE2 up to smithereens. And what it was, I was drinking with a couple of them. <laughs> so they had done a check on the ship of all our criminal records and bump targeted me. Oh, no. So I got sacked. They found enough gelonite in Southampton to blow the whole ship up. They got two of the guys that I was drinking with. I think they got 15 to 20 years. I don't know where the tip came from. So next thing I got sacked. Where am I again? I'm back onto the streets of Liverpool. I'm back on the streets. I go home, just had a lovely life on the, on the Queen Elizabeth II for a few years, bought a nice car, I was going to buy it home. So I decided to get married. I got married and I had a big, like, um, a massive wedding with the money I'd saved off the QE2. I was making thousands, thousands on the side. And I got married and it was... It was in the item suites. It cost me a fortune. Oh, I was like 400 people 
at the wedding. And it was like, um, if you looked at, if you looked at the Godfather's wedding and you looked at my wedding today, it was similar. It was actually similar. Because people look at my wedding albums now and they say, this is like the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a blue suit on, velvet suit. Look at you. Look at this. 400 people, big party. After the wedding, I was on my own. So I drove down to my mother's house and I passed a, a bus stop and there was a guy at a bus stop. So I pulled the car around and he was a bit of a hard lad, this kid. Very tough guy. I don't know if you heard of Aiton Baddies in, in a, there's an area, a suburb in Liverpool called Aiton. Aiton. Aiton, yeah. next to Witness. Cr yeah. Witness, Cranton, Aiton. Okay, yeah. All yeah. right. So there's some hard kids in Aiton. Really hard, oh, yeah. hard, tough guys. It was very renowned in, in England and he was one of them. So I pulled the car up and went, all right, lads, where are you going? He said, um, oh, I'm just going to do something. And he knew me very well that he could trust me. So he said to me, can you give us a... He said, I'm waiting for the bus. I'm waiting ages here for the bus. There's 60 bus to go to Bootle from Queen's Drive. So I said, yeah, I get in. So we go to the art said, he said, I'm not sound, you know what? I might bend you in on this. And I went, what is it? And he sort of wouldn't tell me. He said, go on. He said, well, I'm going to the gyro in Bootle. Now, the gyro is the biggest place in Liverpool where it dis distributes all the money to the post offices in the whole of Liverpool. And I'm going, all right. So he said to me, will you meet me here tomorrow? He tells me that and then it's in my head. It's gone right in my head. I meet him the next day. And he sits down, he said, um, he's with another guy. And then this, he said to me, this guy, he said, this is Jacko Fitzpatrick. He's from Cantrell Farm, next to Aiton. And I said to him, I've got just got a flat in Cantrell Farm of um, the government. I'm moving there. And he went, are you? He said, yeah, well, he said, I'll be in the black horse. I said, okay, I'll see you in there. But he was older than me, a lot older. And he'd done the approved schools and everything. But I'd heard that he was one of the greatest bank robbers in the northwest of England. This is how I, I start my life with him. And he said to me, Terry, are you sure you want to get into this? And I went, yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure. Because I was in fear of no one, I could fight. And the only thing to me was not carrying any guns. I was a little bit against that because I had the power to take anyone down or any security men, anyone. We had that power and I would always be the leader. So. This particular day, Jacko would spoke to me. He was in another pub and he said, I'll tell you confidentially. He said, but I, Jack, in a van in Cantrell Farm. It's the first stop. It'll be 65,000. We reckon 65,000 to 100 grand. He said, Teddy, do you want to drive the car? I said, well, to be honest with you, I've been to the gyro. And I've done my own surveillance and I'm going to be doing what you're doing. So I said to him, I've been following a van and it's going to Outer Bootle into Sefton and it does 11 drops. So I worked it out for three months. The 11 drops would be about a quarter of a million pounds at the time. So I went out, I picked a guy from, um, one of the toughest guys from Kirby in Liverpool, and then I picked my old partner, John Lally, because I'd been done so many things with John. And I picked another guy who was a bit of a tough guy, 
But really, he was a shit house when it comes to it. He was going to be the second driver. The first driver I had was a, a guy called Paul Williams. Was one of he could have been a racing driver. This guy, he learned us how to steal cars, and we had a group called the Hell and the VH drivers, the Vic Hell drivers, in between Norris Green and Walton, and we'd rob all the you know the Capris, the Cortinas, and everything that we'd rally with them. We'd get the MGBs. The, and, that, and we'd have the police chase us and we'd always get away. And Paul was the best. So he would be on the first driver. My second driver was Frank Glass. He's a tough guy. So we thought he was. And heavy man from Kirby and me and John. I was the main man. This was set up for three months. We would strike on... It was a bank holiday at the end of April that the following weekend, the following weekend it was a bank holiday so that there would be two loads of money and we would strike at nine o'clock. It was all set up. I'd taken them there. I got the safe house ready. I had the safe house ready from another tough guy that I was in Boston with. It was all taken, but nobody knew where I was going. I would be the main man to carry if any trouble started. I would give them the directions what to do, where we're going, and what we're going to do to hijack it. So in Los Angeles, there was a movie called Heat. Brilliant. One of the greatest uh, I've ever seen. Now they are actors. In life, when you've done something like this, what we were going to do. I don't know where it comes from and who we are and why we're doing it, but it takes something, some men to do it and especially to do this. I'd always remembered about the great train robbery, which probably was easy to stop a train and just get some mailbags. The whole objective of doing a, ro a robbery is to get away is one of the most significant things is to do is to get away. And then the men that you're doing it with is that you don't leave any forensic and then you don't leave any of this. No grassing. So we're all set. The night before, they'd already had the directions what to do. The night before, we'd had a few drinks. That following morning from the nervous system, I was being sick from nerves because it was, it, it was a heavy job. Now, in 1969, there was a job done in, in um, Liverpool. Um, it was called the Water Street Bank. And my friend had done that Water Street Bank. His name was Tommy Comerford, who I'd got to know very well. And then also there was another gang from Heighton, when I was doing physiotherapy in Walton, a guy called Tommy Smith, and they hijacked a, a sorting office in um, Worcestershire. And, but the police were waiting for them. They got a tip off. And Tommy got shot in the arm. And Tommy Comerford would give a, a, a cigarette light, lighter to a lawyer. And the cops seen it. And they caught Tommy, and Tommy got 10 years. So I knew that we would be, we were, if we were caught, we would get a long sentence. But we didn't care. And also I was married. And I, I don't know why, but we, we set out to do it. It was all set that morning. No one knew what I was carrying. I never told anyone. The van pulls up. The car's supposed to pull up beside the van. All the windows are down on the van. John would get the guy on the floor, in the back, put all the bags into the down windows, into the back of the truck, the, the car, the stolen car. Paul pulls up. I'm watching. They're too slow. John doesn't make it. The guy gets out. He's got one bag. As he's taking it in, there's a guy standing on the door. What does he do? 
He doesn't go for the bag. He punches him with a heavy punch. The post office guy who's carrying the bag flies through the window, smashes right through it. The plate glass window, as big as this wall. He goes through the window, he's cut to pieces. Now, there's a line, a queue, all getting the pensions, because it's double money. There's a milk float in the corner here. This goes off, and I'm going, oh my God, he hasn't got, he hasn't got the bag. The guy would not let go of the bag. So I ran from behind a tree, we're all... We've got the masks on. We're all in black. I go over and I grab the guy. He's cut to pieces. And he won't let go of the bag. So I had a rifle down one part of my body here that was loaded. And on this side, I had a claw hammer. So I said, let go. And he wouldn't let go. So what I decided to do was take the claw hammer out and just threaten him. I didn't want to hit him. And I was so shocked what's going on. We had to follow through. They were at my orders. I get the bag. It's a big bag. It's, it's, there's a sig significant amount of money in there that we'll never get. But it's all gone wrong. Absolutely gone wrong. Paul's in the car. A guy comes behind the car and whams us in and we can't get out. We're stuck. Imagine this. All the people that are getting the money run to the milk float. They get the bottles of milk and they start throwing them at us in the car. We cannot get out the car. I get out I go round, Paul, get out. Drags him out. Get in the back. Get in the back. So I did the, the Vic Hell Drive movement. The Hell Driver. Vic Hell Drivers. Put the car into reverse. Put the clutch very low. Let it out a little bit. Vroom. Boom. Push them off us. Push them off us. I got the car out. Next thing, all the bottles. As we were getting into the car, were smashing all over us. We had glass and milk all on our heads, all over our bodies. And as we got in the car, the glass and the milk was all in the car. But we got the bag. I'd actually got the bag. And one of the things is, I was going to pull the rifle out. And I was going to shoot it at the, the bystanders in the air to back off us, but I'd, I didn't have to use it. I left it. We get off. Now we've got to get to the second car. They press the screamer off on what did you, they carry a screamer with them. As the one man will stand, he has a screamer. It's called a black box screamer. When that goes off, it's like an alarm, but it screams crazy to scare you away. That was going off. The alarm was going off in the post office and we could hear the police sirens coming. And I went, oh my God, this has all gone wrong. We get to the second getaway car was in a construction zone. I get there. I see a taxi. It's not the guy's car, the stolen car that he should have got the night before. It's his own taxi. And I'm going, what the fuck is he doing? And I look to the right and there's a little kid mixing cement. And of all the commotion that morning, the kid's mixing the cement and he sees these guys all in black with masks on getting in the taxi. What does he do? He takes the taxi number. Of course. He took the taxi number. So I told the taxi driver, Frank, 
Go home, lad. You're going to get it. Just say you picked us up as a fair. Got me and John at the safe house. The other two went. Bump. I get in the safe house. Takes all my clothes off. It was all organised. In plastic bags. Got to be burnt. New set of clothes. Got the bag. Got the bag on there. Could still hear the police sirens. John's quiet. John was a quiet lad. He didn't say nothing. I'd done most of the work. Anyway, we sit down. We're having a cup of tea. Calming down. We had new clothes on. And my plan now was, the taxi driver's going to get caught. We're going to get it. So my plan was to go to the east end of London. I'd been in London with a few gangsters in Barking Road in Cannon Town. And I'd worked with a few of them. And I'd met them on the QE2. So anyway, I opened the, the bag as a seal on it. As a silver steel, it's a seal on it. And on that seal, it says how much money's in there. How many £20 notes? How many £10 notes? How many £5 notes? And there was 33000 in it. And I thought, that's not bad, but, you know, we should have... Imagine what was left in the back. Imagine what was left in there. So I said to John, listen, I'm going to leave the money in here. We're not paying no one until we see who gets arrested. So the guy's house that we're in, in the, in, in the um, safe house, he goes out that day and he gets the, the Liverpool Echo. Here we are. We've made the headlines of the whole of the Liverpool Echo. The biggest headlines. One of the biggest robberies that would ever happen in Liverpool. And um, I was like, oh my God. I didn't realise. So that night when it went dark, I had a car delivered to the house and I drove to London. Stayed in London, but I'd, I'd had some connection with some solicitors at the time that I knew were bent, that I could talk to. And I phoned a guy and I said, all right, how are you doing? All right, good. Did you get on that today? Yeah, I did. Okay, what's the outcome? It's you. I said, really? It's me? He went, yeah. It's you. I said, okay, I'll see you. So I was stuck in London. So the big, big shots in the, in the, in the, the, the serious crime squad all over the city from police station to police station are on me. Where is he? And John, like, John's just quiet. Said, John, they're going to be on us. So I had no alternative to return back to Liverpool. Gets back to Liverpool. Goes in a bar. And this big tough guy comes over to me and he said to me, all right, and I looked at him and I went, all right. He went saying, where's Frank's money? And I looked at him and went, you talking to me? He went, yeah, I'm talking to you. I said, I don't know you. No, fuck off. Well, I said, I've just told you, mate. Fuck off. I don't know you. And he starts mounting off. And I said, hey, lad, go away. So I knew Frank had gassed us up. Whoa. I know he'd put us in it. He'd fucking really put us in it. So someone had gone, I'd had a party in Liverpool after the wedding and someone knew where I was, where I lived. No one knew where I lived. That morning I came out. Three weeks later, I'm surrounded by about 20 police officers. Got me against the wall. Never said nothing to me. Never read no Romanda rights, no rights. Put your hands behind the back, you're under arrest. I know they were loaded with guns at the time. I knew they had gloves on and everything. 20 of them came that morning, they got me. <clears throat> Takes me into custody. My, I've never said a word in my life in custody. 
And anyway, basically, I was under investigation. Under Anyway, they said to me, you're going on an identification parade. So I said, okay. They had picked a, a, an old lady who was 65 years of age. She had thick glasses. And she picked me out. That was enough for them to charge me. They charged me robbery with force with a hammer. And the headlines was Wade on the post office, hammer gang, and how it was structured in the news about the milk and the glass and the blood. And I write that chapter in my book, The Glass, the Milk and the Blood. I've wrote that. So it goes into this, it goes back to Risley, where I'd been as a kid, and now I'm, I'm, I think I'm 22, 23. Something was 23, 22. And I'm in Risley, and it's infested with all the gangsters. And I'm walking around the yard, and who's in there? Tommy Cummer, Tommy Comerford. And he comes behind me, and it's all in the news. There wasn't many bank robbers in there at the time. It was mostly for importation. I did not know much about importation until later on in life. So next thing, this he comes behind me, Tommy, and he goes, um, all right, lad, you're the new banker over on the, the block, are you? I just looked at him. Anyway, he goes to court. I went to court. And um, he come back to me and he went, how are you doing and that? And he said, I was involved in the Water Street Bank in 1969 and I got 10 years. And he was asking me about the case. I said, I don't know much about it. You know, I said, I wasn't there. I said, I'm, I was in bed. <laughs> I don't know fuck all about it. I was in bed. And they were all in there then. Um, Charlie Seeger was in there. John Haas. Um, and the Bennett South End. I got to know some of them. I just sat with some of them and that, you know. John Haas was the guy who did. John was quite big. He had the big security where they'd done something. They got 18 years and the MPs let him out. And um, Charlie Seeger was a, um, a good friend of mine, best friend who had met Charlie a few times, and he'd been involved in a murder, and he wrote a book killer with um, one of I think it was Ronnie Cray's ex um, wives. He was involved with one of them, so I knew Charlie. And all my friends knew Charlie. So anyway, I'm in Grizzly. And a, a friend of mine came up to me after about four months. It was John Conti's brother, Jerry. Jerry being arrested for um, travellers' checks, three million on the docks. And he came up to me one morning and he said to me, Jerry, you've got bail. I put a bail hearing in um, to the, um, the Crown in London where the three judges listened to it at the old bailey. And he said, you've got bail. I went down to the PO's office. They come out and they said to me, yeah, you've got bail. Next thing, bump, walks out of Risley after six months. The judge had said to them in the court, why is this man being arrested? It wasn't because of Frank Lass. His evidence is admissible against the co-accused. He said, how is this man being arrested? He said, I've read the reports. The post office men said that they were attacked. I'd mash some. Why would a woman pick me out? So anyway, the trial's going to start. This big trial's going to start. So I've got a, um, got a QC from Manchester. He was a judge called David Brown. Then I had um, a guy called Turner. He worked on the Bulger case. He was defence for the in, in the Bulger murder. He did the, the kids. John Venables and the other kid when they killed um, Jamie Bulger. David Turner was the defence attorney for them. And at the time, he was a junior barrister for me. So what they told me 
The trial was going to start and I'd met the my solicitor. My solicitor at the time was um, Rob Brody, who was very known in the city. And he told me, he said, just listen to your barristers. So the barrister said, yeah, you've got 50-50. And I said, well, what's the other 50? Or 50 get off, what's the other 50? He said, 10 years. Ten years. And I said, okay. So the trial's going to start three weeks before Christmas. So what I did, I wore a blue suit, a shirt and a nice tie. Got my hair all cut off and I had a razor part here. Goes into, with my wife into the, the crown court. My barrister comes out, sees me, he's like, oh my God, the gallery's full. The court's full. Watching, going to watch the trial. He goes back in the court. So I looks over and I've seen all the coppers. They were down the end of the court. And here's the witness sitting by herself. And I looked at her and I went over to her and I said to her, how are you doing, Mrs. Seenor? My name's Detective Sergeant Smith. I met you at the police station. Do you remember me? Oh, yes, she said. I remember you. I said, everything's going to be fine today. And I walked away. <laughs> so next thing, the trial starts. The trial starts. Next thing. The lawyers get up, give the peace. I this queen counsel. I'm going to prove today that Mr. Mugan did the robbery. He's the hammer man. He's done numerous robberies in this city. He threw that into the jury, which is should have been a well, that's You can't do that. The judge just looked at him. That's how bad he wanted me. So my lawyer stands up and he goes, QC Brown, he says, Mr. Mugan, I want you to go into the box. Your name is Mr. Mugan, is that correct? I said, yes. The jury is there. The gallery's full. I'm, I'm just standing there. Your Honor, we're going to call the witness. Yes. The judge's name was QC Temple. He was the one that gave me the bail. He actually came from London, particularly for this case. It was a sign to him that he wanted it. For some reason. I'm in the box, in the crown. I'm standing there. My lawyer says to the witness, can you state your name? She gives a name. He looks at her and he says, I want you to name that man that's in the box. She looks and she goes, Yeah, that's Detective Sergeant Smith. <laughs> <laughs> the judge went like that with his glasses. He said, I'll give you one more question. He turns around and he says to her, was you shown any photographs in the police station? Oh, yes. <laughs> Was it Mr. Mugan? She went, oh, yes. The judge just went like that. Took his glasses off, rubbed his eye. <laughs> he went, I've heard enough. I'm stopping the trial. I'm stopping the trial. They came back, sent the jury out, came back in. Clerk of the court got up. Judge told him, I want you to find Mr. Mugan not guilty. Wow. I get a not guilty. Wow. How'd that feel? I walked out the court. I was congratulated by the jury and all the people in the gallery. Terry, well done. <laughs> And I went, fucking well done. 
I haven't, I haven't done nothing. Frank Lass would be sentenced to three years of probation for being a, a police informer. He told them everything. But his evidence couldn't go against mine. However, when I walked out of that courtroom, I was a wanted man. Mm. I was one of the most wanted men in Liverpool at the time. I was put on a 24-hour surveillance by a serious crime squad from London and Liverpool, and I didn't know. I did not know. And then it starts again. It's going to all start again. Oh, God. And you're going to have to wait for part two of this series to hear what happens next, because it's going to get even more mental. So if you've enjoyed this, please let us know in the comments what you think. And Terry, like, like we said earlier, do you want to lift that up, Jen? Lift the banner. Of yeah. We are going to be, you know, Terry's going to be keeping us updated on when his book's coming out. Do you want people to go over to your Instagram or anything like that? Yeah, actually, it's called The Hollywood Butler. <laughs> I like. And don't forget our sponsor, Coro, as well. Link is in the description box. 5% off code True Crime. Yeah. The Thank Hollywood you. Butler. Hollywood, the Hollywood Butler. Butler. The Instagram. Hollywood I mean, Butler. I love that photo of you. You look very... It's all black and white. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man, give us a hug, brother. What a journey. Right, round two. Yeah. Right. What a journey. Well done. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 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 This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of... Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, been an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialised with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honour. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor.